Martin Luther King had a dream. And that dream became a reality. Yet we find ourselves here in this great nation still troubled at times. This past year was an eye opener for us, not just in Ferguson, Missouri, and here in LA and different parts of our country. We found ourselves in a catch 22. People on one side of the matter were fueled by hate. Others on the other also fueled by hate. And oftentimes we found ourselves asking the question, what side are we on? What side am I on? If we research the facts to try and land ourselves on one side or the other, we're tempted to embrace emotions, thoughts that are not consistent with Scripture, one way or the other. Somewhere during it all, I was made aware of a commentary on the Ferguson, Missouri debacle. They were the words of a National Football League player, a tight end for the New Orleans Saints named Benjamin Watson. And in his words, I found truth. In his words, I found a place where I was able to stand upon. In his words, the spirit of Christ that was both in him and in me resonated. And he says, at some point while I was playing or preparing to play Monday night football, the news broke about the Ferguson decision. After trying to figure out how I felt, I decided to write it down. Here are my thoughts. I'm angry because the stories of injustice that have passed down for generations seem to be continuing before our very eyes. I'm frustrated because pop culture, music, and movies glorify these types of police citizen altercations and promote an invincible attitude that continues to get young men killed in real life away from the safety movie sets and music studios. I'm fearful because in the back of my mind, I know that although I'm a law-abiding citizen, I could still be looked upon as a threat to those who don't know me. So I will continue to have to go the extra mile to earn the benefit of the doubt. I'm embarrassed because the looting, violent protests, and law-breaking only confirm and in the mindsets of many validate the stereotypes and thus inferior treatment. I'm sad because another young life was lost from his family. The racial divide was widened. A community is in shambles. Accusations, insensitivity, hurt, and hatred are boiling over. And we may never know the truth about what happened that day. I'm sympathetic because I wasn't there, so I don't know exactly what happened. Maybe Darren Wilson acted within his rights as a duty officer of, of the law and killed Michael Brown in self-defense like any of us would in the circumstance. But now he has to fear the backlash against himself and his loved ones when he was only doing his job. What a horrible thing to endure. Or maybe he provoked Michael and ignited the series of events that led him to eventually murdering the young man to prove a point. 
I'm offended because of the insulting comments I've seen that are not only insensitive, but dismissive to the painful experience of others. I'm confused because I don't know why it's so hard to obey a policeman. You will not win. And I don't know why some policemen abuse their power. Power is a responsibility, not a weapon to brandish and lord over the populace. I'm introspective because sometimes I want to take our side without looking at the facts in situations like these. Sometimes I feel like it's us against them. Sometimes I'm just as prejudiced as people I point fingers at. And that's not right. How can I look at white skin and make assumptions but not want assumptions made about me? That's not right. I'm hopeless because I've lived long enough to expect things like this to continue to happen. I'm not surprised and at some point my little children are going to inherit the weight of being a minority and all that it entails. But I'm hopeless, uh, hopeful, because I know that while we still have race issues in America, we enjoy a much different normal than those of our parents and grandparents. I see it in my personal relationships with teammates, friends, and mentors, and it's a beautiful thing. Finally, I'm encouraged because ultimately the problem is not a skin problem. It's a sin problem. Sin is the reason we rebel against authority. Sin is the reason we abuse our authority. Sin is the reason we are racist, prejudiced, and lie to cover our own. Sin is the reason we riot, loot, and burn. I'm encouraged because God has provided a solution for sin through his son, Jesus. And with it, a transformed heart and mind. One that's capable of looking past the outward and seeing what's truly important in every human being. The cure for the Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, and Eric Gardner tragedies is not education or exposure. It's the gospel. So finally, I'm encouraged because the gospel gives mankind hope. Benjamin Watson, tight end, New Orleans Saints. I was moved by this commentary on the morning of November 26th. I shared it on my Facebook. Those are the kinds of things that I like to share on Facebook. Not rants. Not my feelings or emotions about somebody or someone. But helpful things. Benjamin Watson was simply communicating what Martin Luther King was communicating there on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial some 50 years ago. My birthday is January 15th. It just passed. Thank you. It just passed this Thursday, and it's the same day as Martin Luther King's birthday. So you all get a chance to have tomorrow off, those of you that do, because of my birthday. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I always admired Martin Luther King his boldness, and his courage. If there were two people in my life that I have always looked up to, they are the two people that I did essays on in fourth grade and in fifth grade. First, I did my first essay on my father and said, I want to be like my dad when I grow up. And the second was Martin Luther King, Jr. It's good to have people that we look up to, people that exemplify the kind of qualities and traits that you and I desire and aspire to have. And in the Word of God, there's a man that we also have learned from as well. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the, the book of Genesis, chapter 32. I'd like for us to study and take a few moments this morning to think about a man named Jacob. 
please go to verse 22. Genesis 32, verses 22 and following. The word of the Lord. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, Please tell me your name. But he replied, Why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. The story of Jacob is one that emphasizes the way a man or a woman at times wrestles with God. Whether we've known the Lord for a long time or whether we've recently been converted and come to know Jesus. Or maybe we don't know Jesus and have not accepted Jesus Christ into our lives as our Lord and Savior. and We've not yet our, had our sins forgiven. Wherever it is that we find ourselves at this morning, it's not uncommon for us to wrestle with our faith it's not uncommon for us to wrestle with God even. It's not uncommon for us to go through struggles in our lives. Face God. Face to face. Be touched by him. And limp away. Many of us have been touched by life. Many of us right now remember the place. We remember the Jabbok in our lives. We remember the place of total surrender. Because you have scars and marks to prove it. For some, our faith didn't become real until God shook our lives up. Others of us saw what God was doing, observed God's goodness and his grace and said, that's what I've been needing. That's what I've been looking for. And we've grabbed a hold of the hem of the garment of Jesus. We've held on to the angel and said, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. Jacob, at this point in his life, had been running. He was a fugitive of his own doing. He was an escapee of his own faults. You see, he stole the birthright from his brother Esau. 
Esau gave up his birthright for a bowl of red stew. The kind of hot chili stew. The homemade kind that Pastor Kevin makes that's bomb. He traded it in for his birthright. And Jacob said, give me that. And when it came time, Jacob, as a young man, said, now's the time. He deceived his father, Isaac, took the inheritance and the blessing. When Esau came to finally receive his inheritance, he says, I already gave it to you. He says, no, that wasn't me. He says, your brother took it from you. Esau wanted to kill his brother, so Jacob fled. And the rest of Jacob's life, he feared that his brother, when they crossed their, each other's path, he would kill him. Because Esau was a man of war. He was a man of the field. He was the hunter. Jacob was the one who stayed back in the camp and helped his mom secure things and do things around the camp. So Jacob was really loved by his father. Though, though Esau was the one who always had to go and do the hard work, the dirty work. Jacob was the one that always went to his father and said, Daddy, I want the best. And Isaac loved his son, Jacob. So you see, Jacob fought inwardly. And he was never able to find the true peace that he had wanted. The true kind of peace that he was looking for in his life. Are you awake? Are you listening? Because watch this. Though God's hand was upon Jacob, though he was blessed, though he was, he was a man who, who was prosperous, he had many possessions, there was still something that he had to do. Still something that only he could do. And that was to face his giants, to face his brother. He couldn't run for it, from it the rest of his life. There's no way to live. That's no way to live, to be running from our past. God brought him to a place called the Jabbok River, a place that I like to call the place of total surrender. This year, I believe God wants you and I to come to that place in our lives where we're finally ready for the change that God wants to bring. For the newness of character. A chance for God to do a complete work in our lives. My first point today is this. When it's your time, when it's high time, number one. You got to get up. Verse 22 says, that night Jacob got up. Sometimes when we stay down too long, it's like we're paralyzed by life. The event, the situation, that thing that we can't forgive ourselves for is the thing that paralyzes us, holds us down. It's too heavy for us. But we have to muster up the strength and the courage to get up. That's the first step to God doing a greater work in our lives. You can't stay down any longer. God wants to turn things around in your life. Number two, verse 24 says, So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Point two, in the end, it's just you and God. It's just you and God. Jacob took his family to the other side and said, go cross. I'll come back and meet you when I'm ready. There's things that only God can do in your life. Your wife can't force you to change. Your parents can't bring the kind of change that God wants to do in your life. Your girlfriend can't cause you to change or do the things that she wants you to do. Only God can. Your boss can't change you. 
Your kids can't change you. Oh, Daddy, would you just please stop smoking? Do you know what? How many times have we been inspired to make change, inspired by something or someone to, bring, to, to make change in our lives, but it was only temporary? Because the work was not a lasting work. It was the temporary work that was only brought about by temporary inspiration. But the word of God can bring permanent change. God can bring the kind of permanent change that you and I need. AA can only bring about temporary change. Only Jesus can change a drug addict. Only Jesus can deliver somebody from alcoholism. Only Jesus can deliver somebody from sexual addiction. Only Jesus can deliver somebody from an addiction to hatred and anger. Only Jesus. Leah and Rachel, they knew the most inward and inmost thoughts of Jacob. His whole life he told them when he would be laying awake at night, unable to sleep because of what he did to his brother, wanting to make things right with his brother. Can you imagine being at odds with your brother for the majority of your adult life? Your loved ones. Oh, if I could just see my, oh, if he would just, oh, I would love him, oh, but he would kill me. I know it. I did him dirty. Jacob, you need to send word to your brother and ask for forgiveness. It's the only way you'll be able to move forward. They would whisper sweet nothings in his ear until finally Jacob came to the Jabbok and he said, it's time. I am ready. The Lord is asking us today, are you ready? Are you ready for real change? Are you ready for total surrender? You don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be held back by commitment issues. I know how you are. And I love you just the way you are. Nobody can change you but me. Pastors can't change us. Number three. God is ready when you are. God is ready when you are. He'll meet you there at the Jabbok. Maybe we've tried to change things in the past and we only changed them because we got caught. Those may be very practical reasons why to change, but that won't bring lasting change either. Only a heart that seeks to do God's will will bring forth lasting change. Point number four. Lasting change comes as a result of wrestling with God. Verse 25 says, When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Some of us are so stubborn. Even God says, God, you just won't quit. You're going to kill yourself before you quit. You're going to kill yourself before you're even able to reap the harvest of surrender. It's going to be too late. You're going to have regrets. 
your family will have regrets. Don't wait. You've been wrestling your whole life. Surrender. You're no less of a man when you throw in the, the towel to Jesus. We're no less of a woman. We're no less of a man. We're no less of an individual or a person that has our own personality because we finally say yes to God and no to our flesh. The wrestling is over. God's getting ready to change your name. God's getting ready to change your character. Look what it says in verse 28. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. And that's why God has called you Israel. That's why we are part of the children of Israel. We are God's chosen people. When we gave our life to Jesus, God changed our name from sinner to child of God, from alcoholic to redeemed, from drug addict to saved. God will give you a new name, and he'll give you a new character. If any man is in Christ Jesus, he is a new man. Old things have passed away, and all things have become new. So today, God has brought us to the edge of the Jabbok River. And because he's a gentleman, he asks us, are you ready? He never forces you. He may touch your hip, but he doesn't force you. He'll change your name. Proverbs 22.1 says, a good name is more desirable than great riches to be esteemed better than gold and silver. There was a man who was constantly passed over at work for a job. He'd been with the company for 20 years. Every time it came time for promotion, somebody moved on. A spot opened up just as he would begin to get his hopes up. Somebody else took his position. He was leapfrog. People from below, below him were put into those positions. He was getting frustrated, angry. Started to talk bad about his boss. Would go home and he'd vent to his wife. I can't believe it. I've been with this company 20 years. I keep getting overlooked, passed over. But I'm the most qualified. I have the most years. I have all kinds of experience, all my certifications. His boss very, very seldomly would even come and talk to him. He practically walked down the hallway and ignored him as he passed him backwards and forwards. After all these years, his wife would always tell him, you got to go and talk to him. You got to, no, man, forget that guy. I ain't talking, no, I ain't begging to nobody. I ain't kissing nobody's butt. I ain't going to bow down to him, nobody. I'm nobody's errand boy. Well, fine. Do whatever you want, his wife said. Till finally, he came to a place in his life where he said, enough is enough. I'm going to go and have a talk with my boss and I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. Baby, how much do we have in our 401k? <laughs> I might get fired. But I'm going down swinging. She says, sweetie, that's, that's, that's not the way. We got bills to pay. We got a mortgage. We just got the new car like two months ago. We just got the new cover, California. (laughs) 
Just go and ask him and find out why. So the man swallowed his pride. Fine, I'm doing it. Today's the day. He walked into his boss's office. Yeah, come in, Rick. It's John. Oh, sorry, Juan. How can I help you? I just, just wanted to come in and say hello. And, you know, I noticed that a lot of folks have been getting promoted. And I've been here 20 years and I worked really hard. And I'm one of your, your best workers, your best employees. I've never caused you any problems. And it just always seems that I'm always overlooked when it comes time for promotion. He says, well, I thought you'd never ask. Have a seat. He sat down. He said, well, what seems to be the problem? He says, I don't know. I, 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 I do good work, and I'm just frustrated. I'm at the point where I guess I want to learn how I can get better. I want to learn what it's going to take, what I got to do to get a promotion. He says, well, okay. I've been looking at your work. A lot of holes in it, a lot of problems. We have to constantly redo the stuff that you do. Other people submit work that's cleaner, better, and on time a lot earlier. At times it seems that you don't even care because you keep bringing in the same kind of work. He says, well, I thought I was bringing in good stuff. He says, well, I had a lot of problems, a lot of issues. If you just focus a little bit more, take a little bit more time to make sure that your work is immaculate. Check it over a couple times. May have somebody else look at it before you turn it in. Show me that you care. Next time promotion comes up, we'll consider it. Okay? Thanks for coming to talk to me. I got a lot of respect for that. Last time somebody came in here and chewed me out, I fired him. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. I'll make sure to get right on it. See, that man had come to a place of total surrender. He came to a place where he was finally able to stop pointing fingers and look at himself in the mirror. A Jabbik experience. A Jabbok experience. Jacob had to do it on his own with God. And the Lord wants to do that greater work in you and I as well. This year, our church annual theme is Restore. Restoring people to God, family, church, and community. How many of us want the Lord to do a greater work of restoration?